What's the mind-body problem? Well, there isn't just one mind-body problem, there are several. We'll talk now about three different mind-body problems. They're all related to the difficulty we have in understanding how mental events can be realized in physical events. The first mind-body problem concerns the issue of how mental events are realized in physical events, in particular in neuronal activity. The philosopher Leibniz said that identical things must have identical properties. This seems reasonable enough. How can two things be the same thing but have incompatible or contradictory properties? Let's say mental events are identical with physical events. Then you'd expect mental and physical events to have the same properties. But mental and physical events obviously don't have the same properties. Physical events have mass and momentum, whereas mental events, like a perception of redness or pain, lack mass and momentum. Physical events are publicly observable. For example, I can open up your skull and brain and observe the activity of neurons in your head. But mental events are not publicly observable. I can't open up your mind and observe your experiences or experience your experiences of, say, redness or pain. So we probably have to let go of the idea that the mental and physical are identical in any sort of simple uh, direct identification where we argue that they are one and the same thing. Since a direct identity relationship runs into the problem of mutually incompatible properties between the mental and the physical, we have to uncover a different relationship between the mental and the physical. One proposal is that the mental is realized in or supervenes upon the physical. Let's define this odd term supervenience. Mental events supervene on physical events when there can be different sets of physical events that realize the same mental event, but there cannot be different mental events that are realized in a single physical event or single brain state. So a given mental state can be realized in many different brain states, but two different mental events or states must be realized in different brain states. To make the uh, supervenience relationship clear, think of how the architecture of a house is realized in the material of the house. Two houses can have the exact same architecture, but be made of different particular instances of wood or metal or plaster forms. But two houses cannot have different architectures and be made of identical instances of those physical things in the same spatial relationships. So the supervenience relationship suggests that there is an asymmetry between the physical and the mental. The mental is realized in a particular instance of the physical, but could have been realized in other physical instantiations. In contrast, the physical is not realized in the mental. A given mental event, say, having the experience of a toothache, can be realized in many different neuronal states, but if there are two different mental states, they must be realized in two different physical states. Even if we accept that the mental supervenes on the physical, or is entirely realized in the physical, we still have to ask what aspect of the physical is the mental realized in? Is the mental realized in the material aspects of the physical, the shape of the physical, the dynamic patterns over time of physical events, in spatio-temporal relationships among physical events, even when such relationships among physical things may not themselves be physical? We'll return to this first mind-body problem later, but for now, let me just say that later in this course, I will argue that information is realized in acts of decoding patterns in input. Since patterns in input are immaterial, even if realized in matter, and since acts of decoding do not themselves have mass or momentum, we can get around the problem that the mental and the physical seem to have properties that cannot be linked in a direct identity relationship. A second mind-body problem is the problem of what the neural code is or what the neural codes are. What information are neurons communicating to each other as they fire and decode patterns or rates of firing in their inputs? How do neurons encode and decode information in patterns or rates of neuronal firing? We haven't yet had our Watson or Crick in neuroscience who has deciphered the neural code. In fact, I don't think we've even had our Darwin yet to offer an overarching theory of information in the brain that can unify a vast span of observations as Darwin's idea of natural selection did for biology. My guess is that once the neural code is cracked, and I'm an optimist, I believe it will be cracked, this could be as momentous for our civilization as the cracking of the genetic code in the 1950s has been. 
If you happen to be the one to crack the neural code, please email me and let me know. I hope to learn the answer to this great puzzle before I die. A third mind-body problem is the problem of mental causation. If information is assumed to be realized in physical events, why not just talk of causation among physical events, say, of atoms bumping into atoms or quarks interacting with quarks? If all causation reduces to causation at the bottommost level of reality, say, of quark-on-quark -quark interactions, where there is no need for mental descriptors like, it looks red, or it hurts, or it feels immoral to me, then mental causation is epiphenomenal. Any apparent causal powers of the mind would be illusory. For example, I can make the shadows of my two hands look like they're knocking into each other and causing each other to move, but we all know that shadows can't really be causal in this way. If all causation is physical causation, and if information cannot be causal in the universe, then there can be no free mental causation or free will. And yet, the mind seems to be causal in a very undeniable way. For example, if I ask someone to please describe the contents of what they are now experiencing to me, namely the contents of their consciousness, it's hard to see how the contents of their consciousness play no role whatsoever in what they subsequently say or in the motions of atoms in their jaw that follow from what they say. For example, if they say, my tooth hurts, it's hard to understand how their conscious experience of pain can play no role in the trajectories of the calcium atoms in their jaw when they describe what they're experiencing. But if this is correct, then consciousness and mental events are indeed causal of physical events in the universe. But how can this be? One of our goals will be to understand how mental events can be causal in a top-down manner of physical events, such as the trajectories of calcium atoms in your jaw. We'll return to all three of these mind-body problems again and again during this course. These are ancient problems that great minds have grappled with since at least the time of the ancient Greeks. But neuroscience has advanced to a point now that it can shed valuable light on possible solutions that were not visible to the ancient Greeks or even to philosophers of a hundred years ago. One of our goals in this course will be to grapple with what modern neuroscience can offer in terms of possible solutions to these ancient, fascinating, and frustrating problems collectively known as the mind-body problem. For me, the greatest mystery in the universe, beyond that there's a universe at all, is the fact that matter can give rise to consciousness and mind. Our goal is to try to understand how this can happen in the brain.